Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever this may find you. Um, I'm Shihoko Goto. I am the Deputy Director for Geoeconomics with the Wilson Center's Asia Program, and it's my great delight to welcome you here today. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Wilson Center, uh, the Institute was actually established in 1968 as an act of Congress, and it focuses on uh, policy and analysis on foreign affairs. The Asia program focuses on analyzing US interests in the Indo-Pacific and US relations with one countries in the world's most populous and dynamic region. In less than a fortnight, uh, the world's top athletes will be gathering in Tokyo for the Summer Olympics. This will be Japan's fourth time to host the games, but it will be unlike any other Japan or any other country has hosted. It's already been postponed from last year. The Tokyo authorities are not allowing foreign visitors. They are also not allowing any domestic spectators. Uh, the Olympic team members, their entourage, the media, they will all face strict restrictions on their movements once they arrive in Japan. There's been much debate, as you probably are very well aware, about the pandemic and how it will impact the games. But today we want to focus not only on the pandemic and the Olympics, but also some of the critical issues, including what it means for Japan, um, including its, how it will impact its image abroad and foreign policy implications for Tokyo moving forward. Uh, we'd also like to discuss the geopolitics of the Olympics and what impact the Tokyo games will have on the future of massive global sporting events. I'm very excited to introduce three panelists to address these and other issues. I'd like to introduce them very briefly in the order they will be invited to speak. A detailed bio can be found on the website at wilsoncenter.org. Uh, first off will be Yuhei Inoue, who is a reader in sports management at Manchester Metropolitan University's Business School. He will be followed by Heather Dichter, who is the Associate Professor at De Montfort University's School of Humanities. Um, and he, she will be followed by Jules Boykoff, who is Professor and the Chair of Politics and Government at Pacific University. We are taking questions for those of you who are tuning in live. Um, this will also be um, posted online on our website as well. But for those of you who are watching um, live, you can uh, reach us in two ways. You can either send in your questions via email at asia at wilsoncenter.org, or you can tweet us at Asia Program. Again, the email is asia at wilsoncenter.org, and the Twitter handle uh, at mark is at Asia Program. So let me first turn to Yuhei um, to discuss some of Japan's broader objectives in hosting the games and highlight some of the internal debates within Japan on how the Olympics should proceed. So thanks so much for this opportunity to share my thoughts on this important issue. So for this presentation, you know, first I talk about objectives in hosting Tokyo 2020 for Japan and Tokyo. And I highlight some of the comparisons before and since COVID-19. And also I discuss key debates that are happening in Japan and also that should happen in the coming weeks and also coming months. So in terms of the objectives, before COVID-19, Japan hoped to achieve the four different main objectives. The first objective is to make a significant contribution to economic and tourism development. For example, a pre-pandemic study commissioned by the Tokyo government projected an economic impact of nearly 300 billion US dollars. And based on my opinion, this was probably the most important objectives for local residents and also uh, the general public in Japan. And the second objective was to showcase Japan's capability of hosting a mega events such as Olympic and Paralympic Games, and also showing hospitality for foreign tourists and also athletes compete as a game and government, corporate and sports officials across the world. 
so that they have a positive impression of the country and then they speak positively about Japan after the games. And the third objective is to promote diversity and inclusion principles through international exchange activity, and also highlighting the success of athletes from you know, different backgrounds and that has a different attributes. And this is particularly important for Japan because Japan is, is traditionally a homogeneous country, but they really need to embrace a more diverse population in the coming years because of uh, more of the uh, aging population and also population shrinking. So they hope that they want to uh, be more open up the country to a more diverse um, and inclusive population. And the final objective was to leave a positive legacies, especially in five areas, including sports and health promotion, and also urban planning and sustainability, and culture and education, economy and technologies, and recovery from 2011 earthquake and tsunami. But because of the range of various restrictions that occurred since COVID-19, such as ban on foreign tourists and also ban on domestic spectators now, the public has become increasingly suspicious of the game's ability to meet these objectives, especially contribution to economic and tourism development that leads to strong opposition toward hosting the game, especially for this summer. So how these have changed since COVID-19? So based on my analysis of the media report, I think the government or the game officials have an inadequate job of explaining what are the objectives for hosting the game in times of COVID-19. The primary objective, a primary reason that they highlighted is that Japan has an obligation to host again because of a host city contract with the IOC. Okay. So it is not the Japan's position to cancel the game or postpone the game, but it is the IOC's decision to make all this change. And since IOC want to go ahead with the game, the Japan needs to follow not their decisions. And of course, this is not convincing for general public in Japan. Increasingly, government officials and also organizers are saying the Tokyo 2020 game can be a symbol of recovery from the pandemic and also symbol of fighting against the pandemic. But again, this is not necessarily a convincing argument for general public in Japan who want to see a more tangible benefit such as economic and tourism development. So given the situation, what could be some of the alternative objectives that the organizers and officials can actively pursue? I can think of two different objectives. The first one is to increase psychic income. Now this is about promoting civic pride or promoting feel good factor. So by successfully hosting a game, regardless of the situation, regardless of the range of challenges, people in Japan feel proud of their country and they see that as a success for them, their collective success that leads to more the psychological well being among local residents. And also, there can be an increase in soft power. So, again, success hosting can enhance Japan's reputation and external image that can attract investment by foreign countries, you know, foreign, company, foreign companies in the coming years. And also that can increase intention among foreigners to visit Japan once the pandemic is over. So what are the, some of the key debates that are happening you know, given again the situations uh, in relation to the COVID-19? So what has been discussed? 
So even though the game is approaching, you know, it's gonna be held in nine days. The still the primary discussion is about whether or not the game should go ahead. Well, why now, you know, why that cannot be postponed, for example, until next year? Well, is it safe to force? Or who is benefiting? And for the last question, many of the residents do not see a tangible benefit. So they will say the, the games are held because of IOC. Not they really want to get some of the financial benefit that leads to the broadcasting rights. But in my opinion, there should be more the um, focus toward the future, not after the games are held. Not just about talking about you know if that should be held. I think unfortunately or not, the games can be go ahead in nine days. So there should be a debate regarding question such as what are the key lessons that Japan learned from this? COVID-19 and preparation for Olympic Games exposed many of the issues and challenges that are faced in Japan, such as ineffective leadership, lack of coordination across a different sectors in Japan, and also lack of clear and transparent communication from the government. So Japan is able to learn you know, lessons from this and can improve the country for the future. And also another important question is how can legacies, you know, both positive and neg negative legacies can be managed to advance the country. You know, the, so consider legacies outcome you know, such as facilities, infrastructure, knowledge, reputation, you no know, more financial deficit and also potential increase in the COVID cases and how can these be managed so that a country can have a brighter future after the conclusion of the games. So thanks so much. I know, you know there's gonna be a Q&A session and I'm happy to answer questions later, but also please feel free to send your questions to me after the symposium then I'm happy to answer your questions as well. So thanks so much. Thank you very much, Yuhei, uh, for that very succinct um, analysis of where we stand and also what we should be looking out for and what kind of debate the Japanese government uh, should be having uh, moving forward. So with that, um, I know you've left a lot for us to, to chew on, but let me turn now to Heather. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this uh, panel today. Um, so in thinking about the, the geopolitics of, of hosting the Olympic Games, you know, especially now that Tokyo is less than a year before the 2022 Winter Olympics in Beijing, um, you know, it's important to go back and look at kind of the, the original bids for these Olympics in Asia and, and the way that these games were, were framed. Um, you know, particularly now with the closeness of Tokyo and Beijing to each other and debates happening and have been happening for um, several months now about um, whether the, the ethics over Beijing hosting other issues happening within um, China and potential diplomatic boycotts from various Western states um, of, of Beijing 2022. Um, so obviously the geopolitics very much come to mind in the present, um, but taking a step back and looking at how these bids all developed and how these games kind of came into being, is really helpful for thinking about um, everything in the present. So obviously with the Olympic Games being two years apart from each other, those bids each developed separately and, and offset from each other. Um, however, in thinking about this six year arc of the Olympics in, in Asia, um, Pyeongchang bids three consecutive times for the Winter Olympics, ultimately winning the 2018 games. And Tokyo bid for both 2016 and 2020. So there was an overlap of bidding, even with their initial unsuccessful bids. So I want to actually go back and, and think about um, the 2016 bid and the 2020 bid, because the way that Tokyo framed each of these bids separately, um, I think, brings up a sense of, of where they've taken things into consideration today. So for Tokyo's 2016 bid, this was a bid that um, took place really around when Beijing hosted the 20, 2008 Summer Olympics. So the Japan uh, Olympic Committee selected Tokyo amongst other um, Japanese cities to be the country's um, nominee and, and be at the, the city bidding for 2016 
back in 2006. So that's what, this was the height of really the lead up to Beijing hosting the summer games. And then the International Olympic Committee voted on the 2016 host in 2009. So a year after Beijing actually happened and in that lead up then to London 2012 and thinking about the summer games. And so with Beijing followed by London, that Tokyo 2016 bid really focused on international prestige and asserting Tokyo as um, and Tokyo's status as a truly global city. Now we obviously know Tokyo did not win the 2016 Olympics. Um, Chicago was out on the first round of voting. Tokyo went out on the second round of voting and Rio beat Madrid in that third round. Um, so this sense of, of promoting Tokyo as this global city, really cementing it, you know, its status and international is one of you know, the biggest, most important cities in the world didn't work in that case. Um, you know, there's many reasons that go into why the IOC ultimately selects the city. But then for Tokyo's 2020 bid, it put forward a very different vision. Um, in this time, uh, and this is the 2020 bid, Tokyo promoted Olympic values and really having a sport legacy for Tokyo and Japan the way that 1964 did. Um, that there would be new venues that would then have this legacy for another 50 years within the city and, and the country. And, um, you know, like was already mentioned that there was an element of, you know, this bid was happening after, you know, the real um, part of the bid and, and progress going forward before the IOC voted happened after the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. And so part of that vision specifically said that Tokyo 2020 um, was seeking to use the power of sport to offer hope to the Japanese people and promote national spirit, unity, and confidence. Um, so it was a very different vision behind the 2020 bid um, that ultimately the IOC selected. Now, after the IOC picked Tokyo, then it was time for the IOC to focus on who would host the 2022 Winter Olympics. And China um, you know, put forward Beijing, but this was really initially viewed as, as laying the groundwork, that kind of letting international sport know Beijing can also be a winter sport city, really laying the groundwork for a 2026 bid. Um, they didn't really anticipate them getting 2022. Um, the expectation was 2022 would go to a European city, um, that the winter game hadn't been to really the heart of Central Europe, where we think of largely the Alps and you know, a lot of snow, or even you know, Northern Europe and in Scandinavia, where there's also a lot of snow. Uh, they hadn't been there since 2006. But as more and more cities withdrew from that 2022 contest through referenda, through um, Ukraine's partial instability of, of Russia invading in the Crimea, um, and then the Norwegian population and government's frustration with the IOC's demands as to what an Olympic host would actually have to do, um, this ultimately left only two cities bidding for 2022, Beijing, which was very much a known quantity to the International Olympic Committee. They knew what Beijing did in 2008, that this would be an exciting, ex successful games that Beijing would put on a show. And Almaty in Kazakhstan, which most people had, you know, within international sport had never been to and weren't entirely sure if Kazakhstan could, could pull it off. Um, it was actually a really close vote within the International Olympic Committee um, but Beijing did obviously win out over El Mahdi, which ultimately left the world with this unprecedented within the Olympic movement, um, six year arc of the Olympic games being um, in Asia. You know, so Pyeongchang in 2018, Tokyo in 2020, 2021, and Beijing in 2022. Um, and this was really surprising because of the historic home of the Olympics being in Europe and, um, you know, for a long time, a majority of members in the IOC had come from Europe and would often vote to, you know, okay, well, we had one game in another continent, we'll bring them back to, to Europe. So this really was unprecedented. But viewing the Olympics now in the present, it does seem like geopolitics um, may appear to be um, having a greater um, polar influence on decisions that are being made, um, particularly because with the delay of Tokyo, the Beijing games are only seven months after the Tokyo Olympics, which is a really short amount of time. 
Um, but the reality is that a lot of the decisions that Japan is making are, are being made based on domestic uh, situations and um, issues, as well as international score. You know, these venues are all paid for. Individuals have been, you know, working on the games. They, they've had salaries for years now in, in leading up to the games. They've now had their salaries extended by an extra year by the delayed games. And international sport is so reliant on the revenue that the, the Olympic Games bring in. Uh, the sponsorship and television funding is what then gets allocated out to the international federations and national governing bodies. And so if the games were to have been canceled, that would have a significant financial impact on sport globally. Um, and so, you know, the, the other element where I think is not entirely geopolitics, but there will be an impact from however the next couple of weeks play out in Tokyo with not only the Olympic Games, but then the Paralympic Games, you know, will have a, an impact on, on Beijing because it is such a close um, following Olympic Games. You know, ticketing for the Beijing Olympics hasn't yet happened. And normally um, that would have happened in the fall right after the summer games, but we are now you know, seven months out, Beijing has not put forward ticketing, and it's unclear whether international spectators will be allowed to purchase tickets and attend the Beijing Olympics. So on the whole, um, you know, a lot of Tokyo's decisions and actions are being made, I think, less with the current geopolitics and more with their own domestic considerations and considerations of international sport. Thank you so much, um, Heather, for that very um, solid analysis of the bidding process and the challenges not just uh, Tokyo will be facing, but also Beijing as well. So let me turn to Jules. Um, before you, um, you speak, I just want to we'll remind our viewers that we are taking questions. Uh, you can email us, asia at wilsoncenter.org. Uh, Twitter at Asia Program. Also, I would be remiss if I didn't say that Jules is not only um, a academic of great repute, but he is also a former um, Olympian um, and an Olympic soccer player. So uh, with that, uh, Jules. Thank you very much. And thank you to our previous speakers for their illuminating comments. I want to just start by bringing us back as our previous speakers did to 2013 when Tokyo was handed the 2020 Olympics by the International Olympic Committee. And at that time, the surgeon and Belgian Count Jacques Rogue, who was at the time the president of the International Olympic Committee, he called Tokyo a, quote, safe pair of hands. And since that moment, that safe pair of hands has essentially bobbled the Olympic torch. And I think it's even safe to say that really from the beginning, the Tokyo Olympics has been a cascade of calamities. It has been erased partly by the fact that we've been so focused and rightly so on the COVID situation and how that affects the Olympics. But there have been ingrained problems that we've seen in Tokyo that aren't even so much Tokyo problems as they are Olympic problems. And so one of the arguments I wanna to make today is that if you set aside the COVID moment, which is of course incredibly difficult to do, and you look at the bigger picture of Tokyo, what you see is Tokyo essentially in agreeing to host the Olympic games also agreed to import a number of Olympic problems into their city. And when I say the city agreed to host the games, let me be a little bit more specific. We're talking about the political and economic elites of a city. In all of my days studying the Olympic games, I have never seen a grassroots bid from working people in the city coming together to say, you know what, we should host the Olympics in our town. Wouldn't that be great and wonderful? Never in all my days. Instead, what it is is the well-connected political and economic elites of a city. One might argue the privileged sliver of the city's 1%. And so I think it's also important to go back to that moment in 2013 when Shinzo Abe stood in front of the International Olympic Committee as they prepared to cast their votes. And he was asked about what was going on in Fukushima. After all, they had only recently experienced the triple whammy earthquake tsunami and nuclear meltdown. And so he was asked about that. Will this affect the Tokyo Olympics in any way? And at the time, the prime minister said everything was quote unquote, under control. Well, if you actually went to Fukushima at that time, you would know that things were absolutely not under control. I traveled there in July, 2019. 
uh, where I met with everyday people on the streets, elected officials in the area, journalists that were there. And they said that even in 2019, things were not quote unquote under control. And so that was one of the foundational issues uh, was a mistruth, if you will, on the part of Mr. Abe. The second mistruth, which uh, forms the foundation of Tokyo 2020, is the fact that they called it a recovery games, as we've heard. In fact, I interviewed numerous people, including professors in Japan, who have argued that, in fact, hosting the Olympics in Tokyo diverted precious resources from the affected areas from that triple whammy disaster, and instead diverted them to Tokyo to help get prepared for the Olympic Games. And when I say that the Tokyo Olympics has sort of imported Olympic problems, let me be a little bit more specific. One of the central issues around the Olympic Games in the 21st century is overspending. Oxford University did a study from 1960 through the present day. Every single Olympics has gone over budget. Every single Olympics. And Tokyo was no exception. Originally, it was supposed to cost $7.3 billion. Instead, today, we're looking more like $30 billion. Now, to be sure, a portion of that was because of the postponement. But even before that, a Japanese audit uh, from the government of Japan found that it was already in the range of 26 to 28 billion. So costs went through the roof. A second trend that social scientists have pointed out that also applies to Tokyo is the militarization of the public sphere. What happens with the Olympics is essentially security forces use it like their own private cash machine, getting all the funding and special weapons they would otherwise find it difficult to do in normal political times. Japan and Tokyo is no exception. Originally, they planned on having facial recognition systems at every single venue, a sort of soft opening of this technology, even though it's obviously proven to be uh, racially biased. Now, recent reports out of Japan have pointed out that they're probably not going to be using facial recognition because there's not gonna be the international spectators, but still it's, it's one good example of how the militarization of the public sphere happens under the alibi of the Olympic games. A third trend that unfortunately Tokyo has imported is the displacement of everyday working communities. I was in Tokyo in July, 2019, when I interviewed two women who had been displaced by the Olympics. They lived in the Kasumi Gaoka public housing complex, right in the shadow of the new national stadium. Amazingly, these same two women were displaced by the 2000, uh, I'm sorry, the 1964 Tokyo Olympics as well. So let me be clear, they were displaced twice by the Olympics, moved out of their community and had it shattered for the Olympic spectacle. And finally, the fourth area that uh, you import when you agree to host the Olympics is greenwashing. In other words, talking a big environmental game, but actually not necessarily following through. What I spoke of before in regards to Fukushima and how it was under control and how it was going to be used to recover the Olympics is kind of a classic example of this trope. So as Professor Inoue pointed out, Tokyo does not have the power to cancel the Olympics. Prime Minister Suga stood in front of the world and admitted as much, pointing to the host city contract that states very clearly that the International Olympic Committee has the power to decide to cancel the games or not. They are not inclined to do that, of course, because 73% of their revenues come from broadcast fees. Another 18% come from corporate Sponsorship. So when more than nine out of every $10 that flows into the International Olympic Committee's coffers come from those two sources, you can see why they might be inclined to have a made for TV event, even if no spectators are allowed into the vicinity. So what I'm trying to suggest here is that the through line with all of this and what much of what we're witnessing in Tokyo in terms of the stress and strain that's on the everyday people as well as the athletes who I'll get to in a moment, is due to this through line of the International Olympic Committee. And, and to be honest, just acting in their own self-interest, taking a gamble in this interest, in this case, uh, with global public health. It should be said that medical officials across the world and inside of Japan have long been clamoring for these Olympics to be canceled. In fact, a study in the New England Journal of Medicine found that the preparations by the, by the International Olympic Committee for Tokyo 2020 do not meet best scientific practices. And yet the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, says the games must go on. Polling is not looking very good in terms of global support for these Olympics. Ipsos recently released a poll that found that globally, 57% of the world thinks it's a really bad idea to host the Olympics. Places where it was the most high in terms of people that oppose staging the games are South Korea and actually Japan itself at 78% in this particular poll. 
the United States, where I come from here, was uh, hovering below 50% in terms of the opposition to holding the games this summer. But the bottom line is we really haven't seen anything like this in the political history of the Olympics, where you have all these people around the world saying it's a bad idea to host the games. One last thought in regards to the athletes who I mentioned. This entire process has put a ton of stress and strain on them. And many of them are already uh, finding it difficult to realize their Olympic dreams. After all, uh, there was a study that came out of Ryerson University in Canada recently that compared the amount of money that Olympians receive in comparison to athletes from other, stud uh, other uh, sports. So for example, they compared Olympians to the National Football League, the National Basketball Association, the National Hockey League, Major League Baseball, and the English Premier League of Soccer Football in England. And what they found is with those other leagues, athletes took in about 45 to 60% of the revenues from those sports and those leagues, 45 to 60%. With Olympians, their direct revenues are only 4.1%. And that's why you're seeing right now a number of athlete groups rising up and organizing. You're seeing it in track and field. You're seeing it in swimming. You're seeing it in Olympians from across the world in this group called Global Athlete. And they're fighting for good reasons, for safety, of course, which is really questionable right now as we see more and more cases popping up across Japan as they get ready to host the games, uh, but also to get a bigger piece of the money pie. So these are the kind of struggles that we're going to see going forward. And uh, we can only hope for the best safety of the athletes in this situation. But the fact of the matter is um, there is a risk for them to participate in these Olympics. And despite the fact that the International Olympic Committee argues that these games are quote unquote safe and secure, the International Olympic Committee mandated it that every athlete participating in the Tokyo games signs a waiver that says that if they die of COVID-19 or from extreme heat, if they die, they will not be able to hold Olympic organizers liable. A Tokyo bound athlete shared that document with me. And as Shihoko mentioned, as you, I was introduced, I come from an athletic background myself. I have signed num numerous waivers over the course of my life. Goodness knows what I signed away with those. But to see it in black and white, that if they die of COVID-19 or from heat, that they have no legal recourse, was bracing even for me. And so I think that those are some of the important contextual variables for understanding what's happening as we press ever closer to these controversial Tokyo games. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for those very sobering and, and thought provoking comments. Um, before we delve, we, we actually have a few questions. Um, and they are very much related to COVID and the protocol that's in place um, or not in Tokyo. But I actually wanted to take this opportunity to, to go back to the, um, com the presentation by Yuhei and talking about um, what Japan had expected and what the reality for, for Japan may be. And one of them is this idea of Japan as host nation and showcasing its self power. And in particular, in the case of Japan, its ability to have this kind of hospitality, uh, a national drive for hospitality. Um, at, at the same time, one of the um, challenges for Japan, of course, is um, diversity and inclusion. And I think there was a lot of expectation in Japan that the Olympic Games would be um, a, a supercharged uh, Rugby World Cup. And what do I mean by that? The Rugby World Cup uh, showcased Japan's hospitality. Um, it showcased a lot of the um, technologies that could be introduced to um, ensure that they were broadcast and that the participants were able to join in a very orderly manner. But perhaps most importantly, that there was diversity within um, the rugby team itself, and that um, the definition of being Japanese was actually really challenged by that racial makeup of the, of the national team. And you see a lot of Japanese athletes right now who are multiracial, multinational. Um, and, and that has really put into the forefront for Japan, the Japanese themselves to question what, is, what it is to be Japanese. I think COVID can't take that away from Japan. I don't think any of the restrictions that are imposed at the moment can take that kind of soul searching in Japan on what it means to be Japanese. And I think that would be a very positive impact. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on this kind of the 
if there is one bright spot, can this whole issue about diversity and inclusion be part of that or Japan domestically? Yeah, I think it's, it's a very important question. So and also very interesting question. In a sense, you know, Tokyo 2020, they said one of the objective uh, you know, values they are promoting is unity and diversity. So they uh, actively promote diversity and inclusion principles. But what happened to, uh, you know, for example, uh, Mr. Yoshiro Mori, who was a former president of the Tokyo 2020 organizing committees, and he made remark about uh, you know, female in Japan and such. And essentially, even the president uh, who engaged in this process uh, didn't value diversity and the inclusion principles and how the list of people can change. Um, and also, you know, you're right on, you know, maybe this can showcase Japan's diversity. You know, like you say, Japan is increasing, become diverse, and there's an athlete who have a defined more of the multiracial athlete. But also, I think through the COVID-19, I, I think people in Japan um, became more exclusive. You know, I think they kind of wanted to, um, um, you know, close a country from foreigners. I think it's not just about Japan, but you know, across the world. So I think just looking at the debate in Japan, you know, of course it's diversity inclusion is very important, but still there's a kind of a tension between, okay, maybe Japan actually should close the country because of all this COVID-19, maybe uh, you know, it's, it's not the time to open up and accept you know, foreigners, people from different backgrounds. Maybe now it's the time to protect the country. Uh, from all different issues. But, but I think personally, uh, I hope that, you know, even regardless of what I said, actually Tokyo 20 games can highlight you know, this uniqueness of people from different backgrounds and people can, you know, uh, spectator, sorry, TV spectators can observe that and they eventually value, you know, this um, importance of diversity and inclusion. So, um, yeah, I, I think just in, in my opinion, you know, there is a more of the, idealistic view on that and then but there is also realistic view on this but my hope is that you know there is still some can, kind of a, as you know uh, my, maybe can promote uh, diversity inclusion uh, principles uh, in the coming year so great thank you so we have a few questions as i said um i like to turn to one of them it comes from justin margolis um, an attache of public and multilateral affairs of the Bureau du Québec government office based in Washington. Uh, he says, Tokyo was chosen over Madrid and Istanbul. Would either of those cities have been able to pull off the games in 2020 or 2021? Um, nearly every, there's a second part to this question. Uh, nearly every Olympics in the global north has members of the Olympic family seek asylum after the games. Will that happen at Tokyo, given the major restrictions on who can even travel? Heather, do you want to take that? Uh, I'll, I'll try, sure. You know, it's, it's really hard to say what, you know, what would happen for, you know, cities that, that aren't hosts. Um, you know, one of the um, challenges that Madrid's bid faced was the financial difficulties that Spain was in back when the, the voting was, was happening. Um, and so there were concerns about Spain's ability to be able to finance the games without a global pandemic and the additional costs as um, Jules has rightly pointed out, you know, every Olympics goes over budget and, you know, Tokyo is, is, is quite enormous. Um, the concerns with Istanbul were um, political um, for that regional area, obviously a lot of Syrians um, coming across the border into Turkey. Um, so there were security concerns um, with respect to Istanbul being able to, to host the games. Um, it's, it, it would be difficult um, to really make an assessment. You know, Spain was um, hurt pretty tough by, I mean, the whole world's been hurt by, by COVID. Um, Spain, it was pretty intense fairly early on um, as well. So it's, it's hard to really say if anyone would have done a, a better job with respect to that. Um, does any, thank you. Um, and I think, uh, the fact that, you, as you pointed out, um, it was only Beijing and Almaty that was bidding for the Winter Olympics. There was already a lot of concern, even pre-COVID. 
um, about um, the, the challenges, the responsibilities, the constraints of, uh, of actually hosting these games. Um, would anyone like to comment about the, the refugee um, asylum seekers or no? Um, if not, um, I'd like to move on. Um, we have a question um, from Arrington Celeste Arrington um, at George Washington University. And she asks, um, reform advocates in Japan have used the games to push through policy changes, including tighter regulations on indoor smoking and more accessibility um, and other universal design standards. Compared to other Olympics, Paralympic hosts, do you think Japan has undergone more or fewer reforms ahead of the games? Uh, do you think the one year postponement of the games deep in such reforms or made little difference? I think that's another you hate question. Yes, yeah, so, so the question is about Japan needs to go through more of the reforms. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I, it's kind of difficult to compare to other Olympic games. But um, I, I think in we can talk about kind of a, you know two different things. Um, again, Japan in terms of infrastructure, they put much effort on, for example, more having accessible facilities. And you no, know, I, I visited Japan right before COVID nineteen and twenty nineteen, and I actually was amazed about you know, how Japan actually transformed. You know, the Tokyo um, seems to be more uh, accessible. You know, there are newer um, infrastructure and such. So I think. In terms of infrastructure, I think you know, there has been a lot of investment in it, and Japan has done a good job. But then there's also another aspect of attitude. You know, I, uh, Japanese people are open to people who has, a, you know, um, for example, disabilities, a you know, person with disabilities. I think this more about attitude toward people who have different attributes. Uh, I, I think Japan need to work further on that, maybe Shoko, you, you may have a, you know, a understanding on this because I think, again, Japan is a homogeneous society and I think tendency of kind of exclude people who have a different background. So if even though there's a good infrastructure, it doesn't mean that Japan is inclusive or Japan is accepting. So, so I think my hope again was the you know, Tokyo game could actually change this, maybe can, uh, can promote more the attitude uh, you know, more appreciation for diversity inclusion, uh, and you know, hopefully that that happens. Um, yeah. No. Thank you. Um, we have a question um, from Megan Cox, uh, who's a MAJD candidate at American University here in Washington. Um, she's asking really about um, the Uyghurs in China and what that, how that will impact the Beijing Games next year. But perhaps I can make it a little bit more broad and ask. With politicization of the of the games is nothing new. Um, next year, because of China, we're going to see um, greater uh, scrutiny about um, the politicization of sports, um, especially as the United States, in particular, tries to rally like-minded countries to really talk about democratic values, focuses on human rights. Um, will this lead to? In the world of international relations, we don't we don't like to talk about the U.S.-China conflict as a return of a, of a new Cold War. But in the world of sports, are we going to see a return of almost a Cold War type of mentality? We're we're going to expect certain countries to boycott um, the host uh, one set of countries hosting the games, and and vice versa. Are we seeing a return to that kind of Soviet era um, blocks of participants or non-participants of sports? Um, I think that, you know, the, the boycotts we saw of, of the athletes, boy, you, know, you know, the countries boycotting and not sending the athletes, particularly 1980, um, the Western boycott of Moscow, and then the um, reciprocal boycott of the communist bloc, uh, most of the communist bloc of, of LA. Um, what I think we're hearing now is more of, of a political boycott that recognizing the athletes were the biggest losers in 1980 and 1984 because you know most athletes never get the opportunity to become an Olympian and most Olympians only ever compete at, at one Olympics. You know, our, our Michael Phelps, the mobiles, you know, there are exceptions to the multi-athlete, the multi-games athletes. Um, and so the athletes are the biggest losers 
in those boycott situations. And so what has what seems to be being discussed more recently is this idea of a, a political boycott. We will not send any of our, our country's um, diplomats or political leaders to be there, which is always one of those soft power elements of hosting the games and, you know, look, everyone has come to our country. Um, we saw a little bit of that in 2018 with Russia hosting the World Cup um, following the poisoning um, on British soil of um, a former Russian citizen, uh, you know, choosing to live in the UK. Um, you know, the UK chose not to send any um, politicians to the, the World Cup. Obviously, the US never qualified in 2018, so never had to make a decision in that respect. But with the Olympics being, you know, every country, then there's obviously more of those decisions to be made. So I don't necessarily think it might, it will become as great of a divide as 80 and 84. We're seeing a bit more politically, not athlete wise, but, you know, a lot of people have felt that since the Cold War with the Soviet Union and the West ended, that it has become a US China. Cold War in terms of just the athlete competition, you know, and, and who's going to win more medals and, and be better in certain sports than the other. Uh, Jules, I know you've talked about um, the forced displacement as a result of hosting games um, and some people actually being hit not once but twice. Um, I have a question from Dr. Samuel Lee Hancock, who is the president of Emerald Planet. Um, I'm hoping you might be able to answer this question. Um, what are the environmental issues facing Japan and its people hosting the Olympic Games while still facing COVID-19 as a pandemic? And what best practices are being developed by the Olympic Organizing Committee to address such environmental challenges? And perhaps I can elaborate on that further and talk about, and regardless of the COVID, um, COVID or non-COVID, um, there are a lot of concerns from environmental groups about the sustainability of these games. Um, do you see any changes um, in, in Tokyo that are being introduced, or do you see any uh, real movement to address some of these uh, sustainability issues by the IOC? Yeah, thank you. It's a really important question, raising issues around sustainability, especially because since the 1990s, the International Olympic Committee has made sustainability one of its three primary pillars, along with culture and sport. And Yet it has definitely been sidelined issues around sustainability during these Olympics because of the fact that coronavirus has cropped up as it has and just demanded all the oxygen in the room. But prior to this, the track record really wasn't very good for Tokyo. Um, they talked a big green game. That's kind of what every single Olympic bid does these days. I mean, we have these sort of peripatetic bid jockeys that travel around the world and get on board and help write these things. So it's no surprise that there's a lot of similar features, as uh, Heather pointed out, with some of these bids before in terms of the tropes and, and how they kind of move back and forth between them. Um, but in terms of um, Tokyo specifically, it was found by some environmental groups that they were using wood for some of the venues by a group called Corindo, which was a notorious firm that was doing illegal harvesting of wood and taking it out of indigenous lands in places like Indonesia. So that wasn't a really great mark in terms of the sustainability practices. The problem really we've found over and over again when it comes to the Olympics is that there's really no accountability structure to figure out when somebody, a, a host city or the International Olympic Committee for that matter, doesn't follow through with sustainability promises. You know, I lived in Rio de Janeiro as a Fulbright Research Fellow in 2015 and 2016, and I interviewed numerous people who were quite excited about the sustainability promise of cleaning up Guanabara Bay, the notoriously polluted water body where they were going to host a number of Olympic events. According to the plans, the sustainability plans of the Olympic organizers, some 80% of the water that flowed into Guanabara Bay was going to be treated by Olympics time. And the Olympics were supposed to be this galvanizing force to make that happen. In reality, it didn't happen. By the time the Olympics rolled around in the neighborhood of 25% instead of 80% of the water was being treated. And so I guess what I'm trying to suggest is, again, even if Tokyo doesn't follow through on its promises with sustainability because coronavirus came up, even if Tokyo uses wood that's illegally sourced from different places around the world, uh, they're really, it's not necessarily so much a Tokyo problem 
as it is an Olympic problem. I'm certainly not trying to let the people in Tokyo off the hook, but what I'm suggesting is this is almost like a time-worn tradition, greenwashing, and that's why I pointed to that as one of the four main critiques that social scientists have raised. And I think it also fits with some of the conversations we're having around why fewer and fewer cities are, are game to host the Olympic Games. It's because these issues have been raised to the surface and big questions have been asked about sustainability. And so I think that's kind of where we're at right now. Great, thank you so much. And that really brings me to the question posed by Tom Goldman, who is an NPR sports correspondent. And he asks, can there be such a thing as a good Olympics at this point, devoid of all the pitfalls you mentioned, including cost overruns, displacement of locals, low wages for athletes? And what would that look like? Um, maybe I can do from my Zen Square, uh, left to right, Heather, Yuhane, and then Jules. Wow, what a tough question. Um, what a good Olympics would look like. I, you know, um, magically in a city where every venue already exists and you don't have to upgrade, build new, you know, that's always a problem. You know, how many places have a velodrome and, uh, you know, appropriate rowing and kayak new venue nearby um, and sailing as well. Um, and that's not even taking into account Winter Olympics, which, you know, a sliding track, there's, you know, only, you know, a handful of them in, in the world. Um, so I think as a start, you'd have to have a city that had venues existing that, you know, the IOC has more recent, very recently um, changed its tune from, you know, wanting every venue brand new opened, you know, basically for the games that they're now willing like, okay, in this sustainability effort, you know, revamp some venues. Um, but if you, if you had a city that had all of those to begin with, that would be a start. Um, it obviously doesn't get to the athletes um, not being supported financially um, because that is a big issue. And even, you know, there's a number of other athlete groups um, in addition to the ones Joel has mentioned that, you know, the, the athletes really do struggle and, um, you know, there's, there's not an easy solution. So I don't know. <laughs> Um, before I turn to you, hey, and then to Jules, um, I, I was just thinking perhaps the best way to do this is to just bring the games back to its origins and simply have them in Greece and then have them, you know, you have that facility, you don't need to rebuild things, but I have a feeling that that is not commercially viable. So um, with that, you, hey, what makes a good Olympics? Yeah, yeah. To me, you know, I focus mostly on the local region, the local people. So from that perspective, I, I think good Olympics simply is about you know that can make local people happier. You know, they can feel belong to the country. But also, you know, they, they can make connections with athletes from all, all over the world. Again, they can feel like okay, you know, they are actually living in a better society by hosting the Olympic Games. So I, I think focus on well-being. Or happiness of the local region, you know, that kind of satisfy the definition of the good Olympics. Jules. Thank you for the question, Tom Goldman. Um, you know, if we take what Heather said seriously, and I think we should, that one of the first building blocks would be to have all the, the venues in place to minimize fresh construction. There are people that are pointing to Los Angeles right now, and they're hosting the 2028 Olympics, and in some ways they conform to that. They're not going to build an Olympic village because the athletes will be staying at USC and UCLA in the dorms there. At least that's the plan now. It's still a long ways off. But even in Los Angeles, where you have these conditions set up in that regard, you still have major problems with the Olympic Games in terms of displacement and gentrification in the city and also in terms of the militarization of policing in the city. The 1984 Olympics are often pointed to in Los Angeles as a, as a so-called success story in the sense that they didn't just like, well, they did bust their budget, but at least they had a surplus at the end. Um, but there also were incredible negative externalities with those Olympic games, especially we should point out that it's a very classed and racialized remembrance of the 1984 Olympics. If you talk to people from affluent white parts of town, predominantly white parts of town in Los Angeles, they'll tell you that the Olympics were wonderful. That's how you get the 1984 boys as they're known. Casey Wasserman and Mayor Eric Garcetti, who are two of the prime boosters, they remembered 1984 fondly as this lovely time in their lives. 
But you go to other communities, you go to Watts, you go to South Central Los Angeles, you go to other parts in the Eastern part of Los Angeles, you talk to people of color, they have a very different remembrance of that. Poor people have a very different remembrance of the Los Angeles Olympics. And those are often held up as like the best example we have. And so I think right now, the question of can we have an actually sustainable Olympics where you have people traveling from all around the world in their jets and so on, is a really difficult challenge, especially in this moment when the games have become so gigantic, what scholars refer to as gigantism around the Olympics. You know, more than 11,000 athletes will be in Tokyo for the summer games. In regards to, I think it's a very difficult call to, to have that kind of um, happy day in the sun Olympics that, that I think a lot of people crave because the games are so big. In regards to setting them in Greece, I had the good fortune of debating recently one-on-one -on -one, the longest serving member of the International Olympic Committee, a guy named Richard Pound. And this issue of whether to locate the games permanently in Greece came up. And this guy, as I said, is the longest serving member. He's also one of the very few members of the International Olympic Committee who will actually tell you what he thinks and doesn't live in fear of the current president, Thomas Bach. And when this came up, he was like, it was just a non-starter. It was just not happening. Like, the International Olympic Committee, who would be in charge of moving the Olympics to one location, has zero interest in doing it. Uh, for them, apparently, according if I'm gleaning it correctly from the words he said in our debate, um, it just, he wants to spread the Olympic gospel all around the world, and that's the way it's going to be. There's also the question of whether the people of Athens actually want the Olympics. If we go back to 2004, the Athens Games left a herd of white elephants in their wakes, uh, stadiums that are sitting in disrepair and totally unused, weeds growing in the softball stadium, fountains that are just sitting there unused because they were so expensive to maintain. So I think there's an open question as to whether the folks in Greece themselves would be super keen to have the Olympics after their last experience in 2004. Thank, thank you for that. Um, let me turn back to you, Hay, about how we gauge the success of the Tokyo Games. Um, you say you're focused, as you said, on um, society and the reaction of society to sports. Um, would there be a difference in how the, uh, the Suga administration's uh, perception of success of the Olympic Games, would that differ from what the people would see as success of the Games? So if I were Prime Minister Suga, I would say that if the COVID spread it remains at a minimum, they're able to host the games. Uh, they, they clear all the obligations um, that were you know, required of them, um, making all the events happen, uh, all the athletes come and go, that would be a success. And that would demonstrate that Japan was able to host this um, successfully. And I think as Japan, this Prime Minister Suga, of course, is up for election later this year, um, that would probably be um, valued as, as a success. Would you agree with that? And would the people of Japan actually agree with that assessment as well? Or would they have a different opinion? Yeah, I think they have a different opinions on, on that. Um, I think the current approach by the government is that they really want to separate Tokyo 20 games from the rest of the society, the rest of the Tokyo city, so that there won't be any infections, so, you know, or there are not going to be a uh, wide spread of the uh, COVID-19 cases afterwards. And then maybe Suga can claim that you know, the, the has been successful because that's a safe Olympic. But from a, a public perspective, they want to be part of the Olympic Games. They want to feel connected. You know, they feel like they, this is our event. You know, they have contributed to success of you know, hosting. I, I think that, that that's important. You know, it, it's difficult to physically connect because of the bonds of, of life expectancy as, as such. But I think the government and also games also should focus more on the, uh, creating a sense of belonging, uh, uh, help people feel that this is our event. You know, this is an event for the people in Japan or uh, you know, general public. It's not just about elite you know, politicians, you know, games, you know, sports officials. This is about our events and then we contribute and then success these to you know, uh, belonging, uh, well-being as such. So, so I, I think the definition of success should change more toward creating connections, you know, maybe uh, creating belonging as such. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, and I know we have a few other questions, but um, I'm afraid uh, the time has come for us to end this conversation. Um, I do want to thank 
our speakers, um, Heather U. Hagels, for joining us today. I also want to thank my colleagues um, in the Asia program, uh, Mary Ratliff and our summer intern, Sydney Yi, um, for helping organize this event. I also want to thank my colleagues in the Wilson Center's AV team, uh, Sharona and Trion, uh, for doing this. Um, the games are on. Uh, it's happening nine days from now. Um, and I know that there will be a lot to uh, chew over, um, but hopefully it will um, be a good sporting event as well. So um, with that, thank you so much for joining us and I hope you will uh, tune in again soon. Thanks.